as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth, Lord, we are seeing all the growth around us. Just as plants grow with water, we cannot grow without your blessings, Lord. We bless you for everything you give us, our families, community, food, shelter, friends, and freedom to worship. And making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. We thank you, Lord, for providing food for us to eat, water to drink, and plants to grow. Thank you for creating such beauty all around us, the flowers, the animals, rainbows, and sunsets. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. Thank you that you hear our prayers, and thank you that you still speak to us today. Give us the fire that comes from your word. Give us the desire to read, memorize, and understand your word. Amen. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so is my seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. It is Proverbs 3 verse 1 to 10. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This, is, this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with him, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Thank you, Grade Eights. Um, that was a great way to get us into, uh, into God's Word. The passage that we'll be reflecting on is the one that was just read from Proverbs 3, um, the first 10 verses there, as, as Beth just read for us. Um, so as we've now heard them and, and set our hearts to reflect on them, let's go to our Lord in prayer. God, our Helper, by Your Holy Spirit, open our minds as the scriptures have been read and as your word is proclaimed, may we be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today, of course, if you're here, you already know we have the pleasure not only of celebrating Father's Day, but also of celebrating the grade 8 Sunday school graduation. And it's a big milestone for these young people. It's an exciting time. They've gone through this whole journey of Sunday school, and, and now it comes to an end. And they've, of course, had a lot of input into this morning's worship service and their participation in it. And that has gone right up to suggesting the text that we'll be reflecting on this morning. And the text that they've suggested and just read for us is very appropriate for thinking about transition, such as Sunday school graduation or for all of our graduates, whether it's from uh, a school or, or from a university or, or whatever that is. And what I hope we'll see as we reflect on these verses together is that it's an important passage for all of us here this morning. Now, this part of Proverbs is presented as a wise father passing wise instruction to his son, which is fitting for Father's Day. But uh, that's, that's why it starts out with, my son, my son, do not forget my teaching. But of course, 
This wise instruction is for all people, all of God's children. And so we'll zero in right on those center verses that Beth read this morning from verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. If you have passed by our church here in the last week or so in the evening, you might have seen me outside in the parking lot with our four-year-old son, Emmett, who was just in the middle aisle here. See, a week ago, I installed the training wheels on the bike that we picked up for him at last year's Camp Shalom fall fundraiser. It's a black bike, has flames painted on the side. He thinks those are pretty cool. It says Nakamura on it. And uh, now he's got these training wheels on it that he has just been asking and asking me to install. So now that they're on, he is just gung-ho to be out riding. So he straps on his giant shiny red helmet, and we slowly make our way around that parking lot in giant ovals. And I talk him through it the whole time. I say, Emmett, aim for that light post. Uh... Keep your front wheel pointed where you want to go. Don't turn too sharp. Remember to balance. Keep pedaling. Don't look behind you. Look where you want the bike to go. At first, I kept my hand firmly planted on his shoulder the whole time. But little by little, he's going farther and farther on his own without me needing to quickly reach down and turn or straighten the handlebars for him. Without me needing to push him along, he can get pedaling on his own. So I just walk behind him and I talk him through it. I say, aim for that bush. Don't turn too hard. And he hears my voice and pretty much tries to do what I say. And this is the kind of relationship that the speaker in our Proverbs passage wants his son to have. Not only with himself, but also with God. He wants his son to listen and to trust God in everything. In all your ways, he says, acknowledge God, and he will make your path straight. It's like God has a road map for the good life. And if we trust in God, we'll be able to walk according to that map. We'll be on the good path. And if we do the opposite, if we don't trust in God, we're in trouble. In the words of the text, if we lean on our own understanding, or if we try to be wise in our own eyes, not relying on what God says, then we'll miss the good path that God offers. And walking on the good path, walking on God's path is a theme we find throughout Scripture. For example, in Deuteronomy, after God has taken the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, after God has given them His instruction on Mount Sinai and made a covenant with them, but before they go into the promised land, God says, I've got it here somewhere, Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left. Don't turn aside from what I've told you to the right or to the left. God lays out the good path and he tells his people, stay on it. Don't turn to the right or to the left. So to get a concrete picture of what leaning on our own understanding versus trusting in God with all your heart looks like, let's take two kings from ancient Judah as examples. Great eights, you're great on Bible knowledge, I've just heard, so this will be right up your alley. Also, incidentally, these stories happen to be found in the book of Isaiah, which you just read for us a moment ago about God's words. Two examples of kings from ancient Judah. They happen to be father and son. The first one leans on his own understanding. The second one trusts in the Lord. So the father, the first king, is Ahaz. Now by the time 
Ahaz is king of Judah, things have gotten really bad for God's people because they haven't trusted God and obeyed his commands. Israel, the nation, has split in two. Grade eights probably know all about this, and we just covered it in junior youth not too long ago. Judah to the south is the smaller kingdom where David's descendants continue to reign as king. And in the north, there's the broken off kingdom, which is called Israel, northern Israel, where they have their own line of kings. So now, by the time Ahaz is king, the king in northern Israel and his ally, the king of Syria, come barreling down on Ahaz in little Jerusalem. The year is about 535 B.C., Northern Israel and Syria march up to Jerusalem and the Bible says Ahaz and his people were shaken. As the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind, Ahaz is scared and trembling. Now he should trust in God. The God who put Israel into the promised land. The God who delivered them from slavery in Egypt with signs and wonders, who led them through the desert, who led them through the sea on dry land, who gave them water from rocks and fed them with manna from heaven. God is clearly the only hope for Ahaz as these two mighty kings come barreling down on little Jerusalem. But Ahaz leans on his own understanding. The prophet Isaiah warns him. He says, If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. These are powerful words. But Ahaz thinks, no. I need to make a military alliance. He places his hope in Assyria, different from Syria. He places his hope in Assyria to save him from Syria and northern Israel. See, he does what's wise in his own eyes, as Proverb puts it. He doesn't trust God. He trusts Assyria. That's what Ahaz does. Now, Assyria does not end up being Jerusalem's friend. Sure, it overpowers northern Israel, their enemy at the time, and sweeps them away, but Assyria defeats everyone, and eventually, even Jerusalem was their target. They'd already taken most of the cities in Judah, so the hope that Ahaz held in Assyria ended up being seriously misplaced. But then... With the great beast of Assyria ravaging the world, it's Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, who sits on the throne in Jerusalem. The year is about 701 B.C. And Hezekiah faces virtually the same threat and test that his father had faced 30-some years earlier. Trust God? or trust himself. Trust his heavenly redeemer or lean on a military alliance for rescue. And all the military intelligence pointed to making an alliance with Egypt. That's what Hezekiah should do. The military intelligence showed it. The only hope for tearing oppressive Syria off Jerusalem's back was to join with Egypt. So tensions reach a breaking point for King Hezekiah when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sends a final letter to him saying, give it up. Jerusalem is going down. Your God won't save you. We've left a trail of destruction and Every city back there had its own God too. See, Assyria had a track record to show that they could do what they said they were going to do, which was to crush Jerusalem. And if you're reading through the story, 
your mind goes back to Ahaz. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Hezekiah is facing the same threat. What will he do? Well, what he does is very powerful. He takes the letter from Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and he doesn't go to his military intelligence officers. He doesn't go to his political cabinet. He doesn't sit down and start to strategize with his chief of staff. He doesn't shake like trees in the wind in the face of this threat. He takes the letter and goes up to the temple of the Lord and lays it before God and he prays. God, you are God over all. You made the earth. See how the Assyrian king mocks you. Sure, the gods of those other cities could not save them and those cities were destroyed, but they weren't real gods. You're the real God. Now, Lord, deliver us from his hand so all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That was Hezekiah's approach. In all your ways, submit to God. Don't turn to the left to see what danger there is lurking there. Don't turn to the right looking for a savior other than God. So, did God show up for Hezekiah? Here's what you'll read. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Yes, God showed up for Hezekiah. In fact, we have historical records outside of the Bible of this very thing happening. The Greek historian Herodotus writes that a plague swept through the Assyrian camp that night. But the even more remarkable historical record is King Sennacherib's own account of what happened. See, kings back then would publish their lists of conquests as a sort of propaganda tool. See all I've done. Here's what his own account of his attack on Jerusalem says. As for the king of Judah, Hezekiah, I shut him up like a caged bird in his royal city of Jerusalem. Sennacherib tries to spin it as best he can, but in a laundry list of victories, there is one glaring omission. Little Jerusalem who wasn't strong enough to have a hope in this world, but Hezekiah put his trust outside of this world in God. He listened for God's voice and shut out all the other voices. It's like a game that we did in youth group, junior youth actually, where we set up some obstacles and blindfolded one person. Then we told them to try to get through the obstacles while everyone else yelled instructions. And it was chaos. How do you get through? Which voice do you listen to? You kind of stumble along as best you can. Ahaz chooses the wrong voice. But then, in youth group, we tried again. When the blindfolded person was just guided by one person. Only one person could call out instructions, and getting through the obstacles was as easy as a straight path. 
because there was just one voice to listen to, one voice that said, this is the path, this is the way. Watch out for what's on your left. Don't bump into that chair on your right. God does the same thing for his people. In fact, we find this promised in Isaiah when things are falling apart for Israel. God gives Isaiah certain visions of the future, which include things like God's spirit being poured out on God's people, which foreshadows Pentecost, and a faithful servant of God delivering God's people from their sin, which foreshadows Jesus Christ. And in one of these future visions, Isaiah says to the people, at that time, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your, ear, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Friends of Jesus Christ, grade eights, visitors here this morning, you are not alone when you're on the good path. God is with you. God is watching over you. God is guiding you along. He's calling out to you, don't turn too sharp. Don't look behind you. Keep facing where you want to go. When you're feeling unsteady, he plants his hand on your shoulder. God is with you. Now, if we back up to the text that Beth read for us a few moments ago and look at some of the surrounding verses, perhaps you could beg to differ with some of the surrounding details. Because if you noticed, or if you read Proverbs chapter 3 later, it seems to look like wealth, health, and happiness are guaranteed. It mentions prolonged life, healthy body, overflowing barns, or we could say overflowing bank accounts. But I bet you all know that's not always the way life works. I mean, even with me coaching Emmett along on the bike, he'll fall a few times. In fact, when he did fall the other day, he asked the exact right question. Why did I fall? What did my hands and feet do wrong? But there are also times when things from the outside knock us over. And Proverbs is about wisdom. And it presents the best path through life. Most of the time, that path leads to more happiness than the opposite path. But sometimes, even this path has bumps we don't expect. No matter what, though, Proverbs teaches the best path through life is to trust God and obey his instruction because that's the path that extends beyond this life and into full, eternal life. And if we look at the wider biblical story, we see that trusting God is really the only path to life. All other paths lead to death. We can take what these verses say about God providing the straight path, and we can pair them with what Jesus says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's where life is. With God our Father. And Jesus Christ is our path to life. I am the way. So whatever bumps we encounter are only a shadow of what Jesus endured to be our path to life. And all of our sufferings will one day be washed away 
fully, when we enter fully into life as resurrected sons and daughters when Christ returns. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Like a parent teaching a child to bike, your heavenly Father is never far away. He will lead you on the good path. When you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear God's Spirit say to you, this is the way. Walk in it. Tune your hearts to that voice by listening to it. It will always point you to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's join our hearts in prayer. God, through your word and spirit, we pray that you direct our paths. Lord God, strengthen us more and more so that we don't turn to the right or to the left. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit when we stumble. Anchor our identity and everything we do firmly in Jesus Christ, who is the way to life for us. God, help us to follow in his pattern. Help us to trust in you with all of our hearts and help us to submit to you in all our ways to your glory in our lives. We pray this through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.